Hello, I'm Britton Clenet, and welcome to China Insight, where we look closely at the latest issues affecting this rapidly changing country. China consumes almost half of the world's antibiotics. That's according to a study by the Guangzhou Institute of Chemistry, which tested the country's waterways and found high levels of drugs in northern rivers and in the Pearl River Delta. How did China's overprescription of antibiotics begin? And what can be done to stem the problem? Peking University professor Zhang Wei is here to help me find out. Welcome to the show. Great pleasure to be here. What was your reaction to the study? Well, I think the number is kind of shocking. China is consuming half of the global antibiotics. It shows, it shows the degree of the antibiotic abuse. It started about 20 years ago. Now it's become such a prevalent problem. I think it's a very good warning signal. I hope this program can be a triggering point where the public or the official can start to do something about it. Is it something you knew about already? Yes. Yeah. Uh, not only the researchers, but the public start to be aware of this issue about five years ago. The uh, public start to get realize that antibiotic is not something that people should use, and definitely not people should cherish. But as for the root cause of the, of the abuse, people have different opinions. Doctors think it's the patients who ask for antibiotics. Patients think it's the doctors who prescribe antibiotics. Uh, people in charge of health, health insurance think whatever the reason, they are paying the money, so mm. everybody is losing. Mm. I think now we are at a tipping point where if we continue to use anti antibiotic in the, in the old way, I think the public health and also the healthcare expenditure will be severe. Mm. Will, 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 will be really in bad shape. Right. I think so. That's why I think now both the doctor side and the patient side, including the official side, are trying to do something hopefully dramatic yeah. to contain this program, as, can contain this issue as soon as possible. Now, you mentioned there's a lot of finger pointing kind of going on. That's something yeah. that we investigated. China Insight spoke to the head researcher of the study, as well as a doctor determined to improve the prescription of antibiotics. Let's take a look. It was this institute that made the shocking revelation that many of China's rivers are full of antibiotics. The man who led the research is Professor Ying Guangguo, an expert on environmental chemistry and exotoxicology. He and his team from the Guangzhou Institute of Geochemistry spent 10 years examining rivers across China. They tested 58 river basins, and they found that waterways in Beijing, Tianjin, and in the Pearl River Delta contain some of the highest concentrations of antibiotics. In Beijing, Tianjin, and the Hebei area, the mm. uh, Hei River catchment with the high concentration because in that region, you can see very dense populations mm. in the region, mm. and also they are a lot of animal farms in the Hebei province. The research indicated that a major cause of the high concentrations of antibiotics was their misuse by people who had been prescribed them. As part of their findings, the team calculated that a whopping 162,000 tons of antibiotics were consumed in China in 2013. That's partly due to a perception that antibiotics are a magical cure for all illnesses. Yet experts caution that they can produce long-term negative effects, including drug resistance. The same goes for intravenous drip therapy. There's growing concern that Chinese patients are using this intravenous drip therapy way too often and too frequently to, to treat just minor illnesses. It seems the instant results that you can get out of an IV drip or out of a pack of antibiotics is just way too appealing and tempting for people. <laughs> To better understand the problem, we visited Pamela Lu, who wanted to speak out about her three children's experience with antibiotics in China. Pamela describes a horrible year when her daughter Sabrina was two years old and was hospitalized three times. After a week in hospital and several rounds of antibiotics, Sabrina's symptoms would disappear. Then, when her daughter was diagnosed with asthma, the family decided to move somewhere with cleaner air. They packed their bags for Sonia. 
But as soon as her daughter came down with a cold, Pamela's panic kicked in again. She wanted the quick fix that the IV drip had always produced. And we, we decided to move her to a warmer city, so we went to Sanya. At the time, Sanya was more like the countryside. It only had one big, one countryside hospital and only a few doctors in it. So we went to see, I still, I, I should stand for this doctor for all my life. So I went to see him and he said, oh, your kid just coughing, it's normal for a little kid. I said, well, uh, it's very hard for her to recover because we've been always have been on this kind of antibiotics, everything. And he said, why, you know, it's usually two weeks, but no doctor never told me for a little kid that if you have a coughing or fever, you're in two weeks to recover. And he said, only two weeks, just wait. I said, no, I'm kind of worried. I begged him to give her antibiotics. And she was, he was going to prescribe something. I said, no, 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 we're always on the drips and it works faster. I want that for my daughter. After just three days, Sabrina had recovered. The far lower Dustu had worked. It made Pamela realize that she'd effectively been giving her daughter an antibiotics overdose. After three or four years old, after a while, she, we get, I get so against antibiotics. Every time I went to see a doctor, if they say something like that, I say, no, 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 no. So then we will usually we'll check, uh, we'll check the blood, we'll ask for the blood check. Then if you see your white cells up, which means that you're, you are infected with a with, with, you probably need the antibiotics. But if the, sometimes if the count of the white cells is not high enough, which means she's fine. So we sort of play doctor sometimes ourselves. And who was a big believer in the curative powers of an IV drip, Pamela became far more cautious. Having built up a mistrust of doctors, she took to educating herself. From there on in, her answer to should I prescribe your daughter antibiotics was almost always a flat out. To discover more about how medical professionals prescribe antibiotics here in China, we visit Peking University's People's Hospital. There we meet Yan. She works in the infectious disease clinic. She has an expert knowledge of antibiotics, which means she has a broader consulting role across the hospital's departments. She says generally, doctors aren't informed enough about antibiotics use.有就是说这个医生对抗生素的这些这些特点不是很了解啊有就是说一些有的时候病人在临床上的情况不是那么好确定啊就比如说我举个简单的例子这个病人是不是感染有的时候并不是那么好确定的他需要需要很多就是相关
Dr. Zhuo Chao is a member of the Ministry of Health's Committee of Experts on Rational Drug Use. He says the problem can be alleviated by shifting mindsets and habits towards antibiotics. So 所以我們很多地方就是原來早前說美國是必須看護師使用必須是通過感染一次來會診來確定的,而中國是說這個因為感染一次隊伍是比較薄的,所以基本上是各個科哈,我自己根據我的情況,我就覺得用了,那這裡
。从他刚才院外的 CT， 我们院内的 CT， 还有你这些感染的指标，还有你整个的治疗过程来看，我觉得至少现在肺部感染似乎证据不足。这个还是专业，专业的角度关注的角度不一样啊。感染科医生，他天天就是跟感染的病人打交道，所以他会非常关注病原体，他会非常关注抗生素。那比如说一个心血管的医生，那他一定关注的是这病人血压的情况怎么样，心率的情况怎么样啊。那一个糖尿病的医生，他会关注啊你的血糖控制怎么样，可能还是因为这个专业的，呃，专业的角度关注的点不太一样吧。A key part of the medical reform taking part in China right now is improving the management of medication. The China Antimicrobial Resistance Surveillance System was established in 2005 to help tackle the problem. At People's Hospital, it's used in tandem with centralized monitoring software. With the help of technology, Zhuo is hoping Chinese hospitals will be able to better manage antibiotics dosage. 检测网就是一个耐药监测网，那么零五年开始建设，建设以后就是现在扩大，扩大的话，现在中国已经是有到去年已经有一千三百多家医院在这个网里面，而每年报送的这个耐药数据的话，已经有两百多万了。这个数据是在整个我我看了世界卫生组织这个报告里面，我们中国的数据量是相当庞大的数据量，而这个数据的话，其实也就是告诉。大家临床还有公众，我们中国现在细菌耐药到了什么状况？而这种状况的时候，我们在经验性用抗生素的时候，我们怎么去选这些药物啊？就是去恰当治疗它。We touched in that video. We touched on uh, the quick fix, the temptation mm -hmm. to grab a pack of antibiotics and you know be be better in a few days. Why does that exist? Is it because doctors are pushing it? Is it because of pharmaceutical companies? Is it because patients are just too used to it? I think everyone has a role in this problem. Let's start from doctors. I think doctors are at the, at the very front line because without their prescription. The antibiotics will never reach the patients, and for Chinese doctors, uh, given their miserable pay in the public hospital, it is understandable that public hospital and the doctors in public hospital would like to seek more opportunity of revenue generation. This is why we see many drug abuse in China, and antibiotics. Is probably the one of the area with the severest problems. The problem is really severe. So doctors, they are the front line. As we mentioned in the video, when the doctors are aware of this problem, they were taking some actions. Mm -hmm. But my concern is, the doctors that we see in the video are top doctors in China. Mm -hmm. What about the majority of doctors who? Who do not have access to specialists. Well, that's right. There's not a, a mm. Dr. Gao in every in every hospital, and that's, this is something that you mm. and I have touched on in other other shows before. Mm. The fact that uh, doctors need more training mm -hmm. available to them, so that, for instance, they know the exact prescription, the about, uh, exact dosage mm -hmm. of, of antibiotics. Last year, I was very lucky to run a research with the Chinese Physician Association. We ran research targeting antibiotic abuse at the county level hospital. The result was amazing. After three months of intervention, the antibiotic use at the county level was reduced by 25 percent. Actually, our intervention was very simple. We give rural doctors standard clinical guideline. We specifically tell them, if this is diagnosis, do this. Mm. Otherwise, you will not be reimbursed. Mm. Very standard, simple introduction of a clinical standard. So only over three months, we see a reduction of 25% of antibiotic use. Mm. So my point here is, for top doctors in large hospital, they can make decisions on their own or through consultation, like we see on the video. But for majority of doctors in, in the majority of China, where probably they have to rely on new technology, like telemedicine or uh, app 
where standard procedure, standard guideline, or even a warning system mm. where antibiotic abuse will jump out saying this is not the way to do. Mm. I think and this all is where this the role of technology can help. Exactly. I think, I think doctors have their own concerns. Doctors need time to improve themselves. But meanwhile, I, I believe technology and innovation based on the standard care mm. can, be a, can facilitate this change. Mm. Well, you mentioned what the doctors can do. What can mm. the patients do? Well, for patient, this is, let's come back to my research. Three years ago, I published research in a top journal. We, we use simulated patients, actors. We prep them for standard case of flu. They are simulated flu patients. We send them to large hospital in China just to observe the chance of their getting antibiotics. What we did you put find? Them, we put them into two groups. One is conventional patients just the one you see on the TV. The other is what I call the patients of internet era. This group just say one thing. They, when the, after the discussion with the doctor, they will say something like, Doc, I learned from the internet that flu mm. patients do not need antibiotics. And I have a lot of doctor friends and it drives them crazy when they hear that. Here's the result. It was published in the top journal, uh, Health Economics, a top international journal. And the result is antibiotic prescription was dropped by 25%. Mm. But meanwhile, patient satisfaction, patient satisfaction was also dropped. What, I, what we observed in the studies, when the doctors realized the patient had this knowledge, doctors become less communicative. They tend to be silent. They, give, they are more likely to give appropriate prescription, but they were more likely to be silent. So what does that mean? Well, there are many ways to interpret this. My way to interpret in my research is Chinese patients are ready to welcome the knowledge from internet. Chinese doctors are not yet. But there's too much information on the internet. Surely you need an authoritative voice who has yeah. done their six years of medical school mm -hmm. and, uh, and knows exactly what they're talking about and what to prescribe. Exactly. This is why I think, you know, once this, this I mean, this, 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 for this problem, I think it's about where we start. Mm. If we start with flu patients, ask whether it's viral, what's the temperature, the white blood cell count. You know, flu is a kind of disease which does not require antibiotic. Mm -hmm. Second is children. Mm -hmm. You know, Chinese parents love their children as parents all over the world. So in some region in our research, we just put a sign in the clinic saying, if your kid is under age of 12, be cautious when you ask for antibiotics. It works as a magic. Mm -hmm. And then now, young parents in Chinese cities are aggressively asking doctors now to give antibiotics. So there is a change yeah. happening? Yes, but the change is not on everyone. I think, that, I think that the start of change is on, number one, patients with flu, it's become a public knowledge. Mm. Second is children. Are pharmaceutical companies pushing their, their products into hospitals too much? I think that's a pharmaceutical companies are doing their job in promoting their product. But they have a responsibility as well. They're in charge of people's lives. It's not, you know, so much pushing mm. a, a consumer I think there product. Are, I think there are two levels to look at this. One is at the product level. The product itself is okay. That's product level. I think that's primary responsibility of pharmaceutical company. I'm responsible for my product. Mm. Second level is the use of my product. I think that's primarily the responsibility of doctors. You don't Once, think they have mm -hmm. an ethical role as well mm -hmm. to manage the use? Are exactly. they offering incentive to doctors for taking these products? Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't call that the incentive. I think a stronger incentive probably for doctor is to, number one, to cure, to help the patients. Number two is to get reimbursed from the health insurance institution. Mm -hmm. For a pharmaceutical company, I think they are in a dilemma. Number one, they have lots of what I call me too. It's innovative, but it's me too. It means they're not that much different from the other antibiotics. So the market is really red ocean. Mm. But the thing cause R&D is already there. So mm. they are kind of trapped. Second is, in China, there were pharmaceutical company can be a lot of help in doing continual medical education in China. But once again, it tend to be selective. If this event organized by company A, I think it's unlikely 
this company is going to say anything positive about the product of company B. Mm. So this comes once again to my, to my suggestion that the training of the medical education should be exclusively done by an independent public institution. Medical education should not be sponsored by any... So this is once again, I think, where China is making big change. Mm. The Ministry of the China Physician Association are taking the education back into their hands, mm. inviting doctors like the doctor to disseminate mm. her ideas. Well, mm. we're going to actually ask a few people uh, in Beijing what they think and whether there is this shift that uh, Professor Zhang is speaking about. We're going to take a quick break first. Stay with us. Welcome back to China Insight. I've been discussing the antibiotics overuse in China with my guest Zhang Wei from Peking University. Can the problem be fixed by training doctors or is it the case that patients are too reliant on the quick fix? We asked people in Beijing if they ask their doctors for antibiotics. <laughs> Ipanda 偶尔可以的。没有，为什么呢？我就觉得可能觉得抗生素对人身体有，呃，有副作用吧。觉得个人感觉就是那个样子。Now you mentioned as we're watching those the age gap. How does that make a difference? Well, obviously the people who live on the internet, the young generation, are giving the voice saying no, or at least want to check first. While the middle aged or even more senior guys are saying. Okay, I should listen to the patient. Mm. This is my point. In when Chinese healthcare consumers start to put more power into their own hand, the trigger or the starting force are young people. Mm. They live on the internet. They they are more at ease with understanding the knowledge. So they are what I call the new generation of patients. Mm. For them, antibiotic use. Antibiotic abuse should not be too much a problem because they're already aware, but they are aggressively asking, why do you give me this? Mm. But the cons my concern are for the traditional patients, you know, the middle age or more senior people who are going to help them. This is where I believe the medical trail as health insurance uh, incentives can really, can, can really contain the behavior of doctors. Mm. So I think for the young patients, they can take care of themselves more likely. But for the older patients, we still need more capable doctors and more smart, smarter insurance incentive to, to cope with this problem. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show, Professor Zhang, and advocating some solutions to this overuse of antibiotics problem here in China. That's all we have time for today. If you have any comments or questions, email us at chinainsight at cctv.com, or you can reach out to us on Facebook, Weibo, or WeChat. And we'll see you next time for more stories and discussion on China, out of China. Goodbye.